This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Last time, Kit and I started on some of the light structural work for this painting. But now we have to turn our attention to the real meat of the work, and that's bonding the panel back together. And of course, that means I'll turn my attention to the clampinator, the most valuable tool I have for dealing with panel paintings. When I built this piece of equipment, it was the realization of an idea that had taken root decades earlier. I had been thinking about it, plotting it, planning it, imagining it in my head, and then when I finally got a chance to make it, well, I was really excited, and so I did. And I did the best job that I could. But of course, any time you design something and use it for the first time, you realize that there are plenty of opportunities for improvement. And this is not because you failed. In fact, this is because you succeeded. You brought something new into the world and then learned how to make it better. That's totally okay. And in this case, the clampinator was built on a modular platform. Instead of using tube steel and welding it all together, which would have been faster, cheaper, and much easier, I decided to use a modular extruded aluminum system, which was slower, more expensive, and more difficult. But the benefit in doing this is that it is modular. And I'll give myself a pat on the back for choosing this system in the beginning because I had an inkling that even if I tried to make this the best tool possible from the get-go, I might one day want to improve it or may need to fix it. Like that one time my son burned out the motor, raising it up and down. <laughs> In any event, having a modular system is pretty key. It means I can take it apart without damaging it. I can go back in and I can change it. I can adapt it, modernize it. And that's not only important for clamping tables, but you bet it, for websites as well. And aside from having beautifully designed templates and cutting edge technology, that's really one of the key features of using Squarespace, is its modular nature. Because let's be honest, when you build a website, you think you know what you want, but that's going to change. And having the flexibility and freedom to click add a store, or click add a newsletter, or click add a contact form, that's going to make your website dynamic. And it's going to allow you to grow and have your website grow with you. Which means that your website will be an asset, a partnership, and not something that drags you down because you're constantly tinkering with it to make it better. And really, it's a sign of how smart you are, because you're future-proofing your website. So congratulations on you. Good job. So head over to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Baumgartner to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. So back to the table. But come on, did you really think I wasn't going to talk about a modular, flexible, adaptable system and weave Squarespace, the most modular, flexible, and adaptable web building platform into this? You folks know me too well. So I am taking pretty much everything apart here. The two gantries that are used to exert the vertical pressure from the top and bottom, they're coming off. And all of the little clamps are going to come off as well. Now initially when I designed these, I designed them 3D and I had them 3D printed. I thought that I wanted something that was going to be flexible. And I'm glad that I did this this way because if I was going to throw all of these out, I would feel really, really bad. Not only because it was really expensive, <laughs> really expensive, and because a lot of time was spent on it, but it would just feel absurd to throw out all of these good pieces of equipment. So I'm not. I'm going to save them, and you'll see why in a minute. But I have to take more things apart. And here I'm focusing on the two horizontal uh, cross members that allow me to exert pressure on the edges of the board, and this is used to really force the board together. These two pieces and these, what do we have here? 10 little clamps. These exert the pressure that allows me to get a good glue joint, whereas the vertical clamps allow me to align it and make sure that everything is how I want it. So these also have to come off. Of course, everything is coming off. And it's at this point where I'm starting to wonder if I'm actually going to be able to put it back together. Yes, it's modular, but I don't know, you take something apart, it feels really easy. But putting things back together, well, not so easy. Just ask me about that car that's been sitting in the back of my studio for, oh, a year and a half. Super easy to take a car apart. 
not super easy to put it back together. In any event, I've taken off all of the clamps except for one, and now I'm going to start adding to this bar. When I 3D designed these clamping bodies, I had some foresight as well, and I put two holes in them, which allows me to remove this kind of fixing bolt, transfer it to the other side, and instantaneously change the orientation of this clamp. And what that means is that I can adapt all of these clamps for their new use, that they're not going to go to waste. At least most of them. Some of them will be stored for later because I don't have a use for them in the interim, but the short ones can be fed onto this bar and interleafed between the old ones that were here. So we have one of the old ones with the star handle, then we have one with the black handle, then we have another one with the star handle, and then another one with the black handle, so on and so forth. So the actual benefit here is that if they all had the same handle and the same handle length, it would be really hard to tighten them down. But because the ones with the black handles are longer, it allows me to tighten them down without my hand kind of hitting the short ones. You'll see when I use it. And then just like that, I can put it back onto the sliding mechanism, the bearing, it's called a linear bearing, tighten it down, and then we have effectively doubled the amount of lateral pressure that I can exert onto the panel. And that was always something that was frustrating. I thought that five wasn't enough. The other big change is the weight of the gantry cross members. Before it was a one by two system, and there was some flex. Now, there shouldn't have been, but there was. And what that resulted in is tightening down the vertical clamp A and then moving to vertical clamp B and tightening it down. But then clamp A would be loose. And then I'd have to go to clamp C and then clamp B would be loose and so on and so forth. So the slight deviation, the slight flexing of this horizontal cross member was causing the vertical pressure to be uneven and less than ideal. So by doubling up the thickness of this cross member, I can eliminate all of that flex. Maybe it was a calculation error on my part. After all, I am in the arts, and so I may have forgotten to carry a zero or move a decimal place or convert an X to a Y, or maybe it was the cosine or Pythagorean theorem. Uh, who knows? In any event, it didn't work. And so by making it thicker, I can compensate for that little flex. Now I'm glad to see that the gantry moves on its own, and I've also eliminated one of the gantries because initially I thought I might need two, but I found out that I never used one of them. So I can get rid of that and put those pieces in storage. And I'll use them. Trust me, I will. The next step was to turn to my 3D modeling software and design a new clamp. And this time I wanted something that was a little bit smaller and again, modular. So I drafted up a 3D housing, a body of sorts, but instead of wrapping around the aluminum member, this one is going to slide into those two channels. Because I have two channels instead of one, I have much more surface area and I don't have to wrap around. Then of course there's the threaded rod, there's the handle, there's the swivel foot, and then inside the clamping body there is a nut into which the threaded rod will be threaded. And that allows the rod to go up and down and to be held into place. And when this assembly is all together, I will be able to use them throughout the vertical positions. If I need more, I can make more and simply slide them in. Unlike the old clamps where I needed to disassemble the whole table, this one is a little bit more modular. And so you can see the first one, 3D printed out of nylon, much larger. The initial prototype, which is tiny in comparison, partially because I got the measurements wrong. <laughs> the second prototype, which is much more accurate, but still had a little play, and the final prototype. So from really big and complicated to really small and simple, also using a different material. The first one was 3D printed with ABS, and then the smaller ones are SLS printed with uh, PA-12. So it's a solid body and much more dense and much more accurate than the 3D printing with filament. So on to assembly. 
When I built the table first, I had my little son here with me, and so threading on all of these rods was an activity that we made fun out of. But he's not here, and I have to do this all by myself, so I've decided to work smarter instead of harder, and employ my drill to get all of these threaded rods onto the nuts. And I am glad I did, because I am making something like 30 of these, and even with the drill, it took a couple of minutes. I know, what's a couple of minutes? But imagine if I had to do it all by hand. I learned my lesson once the hard way. And then, a stack of 3D printed housings, handles, and swivel feet. Lots of assembly. And just like last time, I'm turning to two-part epoxy to bond the nut into the housing body. This is really one of the only times that you'll see this kind of low-grade epoxy in a conservation studio. This is just hardware store epoxy, and by all means, this is kind of garbage. But for this purpose, it is completely fine. Really, all that needs to happen here is to prevent the nut from sliding out. Because when pressure is exerted downward, the nut will push up into the housing. It's just when there's no pressure that I need to make sure it doesn't slide out. And so a little bit of epoxy is exactly the ticket that I need here. If this were for an actual art conservation project, there's no way that I would be using hardware store epoxy. Just, I mean, full stop. But for this purpose, it is completely fine. So I glue in all of these nuts, trying to make sure not to get any epoxy on any of the threads because of course I don't want to permanently bond them in place. And then once they're dry, I can start assembling the swivel feet and the handles. One thing that I also did in making this new clamping body is I lightened everything up. So instead of using half inch um, threaded rod and really, really large handles and swivel feet, I went down to 3 8 inch rod. And it's only an eighth inch difference, but it makes them a little bit lighter, a little bit easier to handle, and it just makes them feel more appropriate for the scale of the equipment. I know that maybe isn't like a technically necessary thing, but if something isn't scaled properly, it can feel wrong and it can kind of intellectually work wrong. I guess maybe that's just in my head, but these lighter and easier to handle clamping things feel better, look better, and my hope is that they'll operate better. So a lot of assembly needed to happen, and I did get it done all by myself, and then I was ready to start assembling them. You can see that they slide right into those channels. There's almost no play, they slide along easily, and they're secure. And the cool thing is that if I need to make more, let's say a project is really big or I want more clamping, I can just 3D print more and put them in. It's a piece of cake. Again, modular and trying to think ahead. All right, enough watching me play with my toy tools and on to the actual conservation work. So this panel has a lot of problems. Of course, it's in three pieces, but there are also multiple splits or checks throughout the wood, and we have to deal with those before we can bond the whole panel together. Because if we don't, the painting, the panel won't be stable and secure and won't be able to handle the pressure and the clamping force that's necessary to bond the individual pieces together. So Kit is applying some hide glue to this joint and really just flooding it. Kind of want to make sure everything gets covered in glue. And it's going to ooze out. That's a sign of a good glue joint. And I'm not terribly concerned about that. A, because the painting is still covered with varnish and grime. And B, because hide glue can be removed with water and some other uh, solvents. So once we've applied the hide glue, we'll put these little blocks down, which cushion the painting against the impact of the little swivel feet and the clamps. They're little MDF blocks with some felt and silicone release paper on them. So they protect the painting, but they also won't stick to it. And then we can start putting force on the painting. And I start in the bottom just by aligning everything and making sure that there's contact. And I raise the table up because in my old age, I no longer like crawling around on the floor. Actually, it's, it makes a lot of sense because when I raise the table up, I have more space to work under and having more space makes me comfortable and being comfortable means that I can do a better job at what I'm doing. Then with the bottom pieces all in place, I can go to the top. And this is where we're gonna start aligning this joint. 
Once we've gotten it all aligned, we can start adding lateral pressure, which is going to cause the panel to be pressed together and allow for a good, good, strong glue joint. So here you can see the offset of the handles being really advantageous to getting your hand in there and having space to tighten them. And look at that. Everything looks pretty tight and well aligned. So after a few days of letting it dry, we can come back and start to disassemble it. And we start by loosening up the pressure on the top and bottom. And then once we've done all that, we can take off these little blocks and hope that they didn't stick. And look at that, they didn't. And then we can start reducing the pressure on the sides. And we go throughout because we don't want to start on one side and reduce all the pressure and cause the wood to move dramatically. And look at that, we have a nice bond. This split that didn't go all the way through has been taken care of. So now we can go on to the next one, and then the next one, and then the next one. There are five or six different splits in this panel in various places that all need to be addressed. And so we're just going to go ahead and methodically work through this process. There's no rush, we have plenty of time, it's also a good opportunity to teach Kit how to use this piece of equipment, because eventually she might need it. And so now, with all of those splits and checks bonded, and with the inlays bonded, we can start thinking about making this panel whole. But that is an interesting prospect, because it's not as simple as just gluing it up and calling it a day and moving forward. If you remember, I talked about this panel being really, really thin and having kind of a compromised surface on those joints. That will complicate the process. But before I get there, I have to make sure that the surface is ready to be bonded. And if you recall, when I did this inlay, I made it larger than necessary because it's always easier to trim off the excess than it is to put back what should have been there in the first place. So with a hand plane, I'm just going to remove a little bit to make this flush. A couple of passes is all it takes. I'm going really slow because I don't want to impact the original wood. On to the big show, clamping up this panel. Now Kit and I are going to start with the easiest joint, where the wood is the thickest, the surface of the joint is the cleanest, and the wood has the least amount of distortion because it's always nice when using a new piece of equipment or embarking upon a big project to get a few wins under your belt, pick off some low-hanging fruit before you move to the really challenging stuff. So it'll give us an opportunity to proof our tool, to practice our process, and just make sure that we are able and confident in what we're doing before we go to the really complicated stuff. Again, we're using hide glue, and Kit is going to flood that joint, just get glue all over it. We're using hide glue here because it's reversible, because it's forgiving, it has a long open time, but this glue is not going to be the final say in holding this panel together. This panel is about a quarter of an inch thick, which is pretty thin. I know a regular piece of wood at a quarter of an inch thick is totally enough to glue together, but we don't have a really good surface here. We can't run this through a planer or a table saw to create a perfect surface for the glue. If we could, this would be so much easier, but we can't. So this joint, no matter how good we do here, won't ever really be structurally enough. But it does start here, so let's focus on here. This panel has a bow in it. The panel is convex, so the center is higher than the top and bottom. And we're going to use the table to press this into place so that we keep that natural arc. We want to glue it in that state. We can't just force it flat and expect it to be an even flush joint. So we raise up the middle using the clamps from the bottom to put force on that joint. And then we start clamping from the top and the sides. And this is a delicate balance of putting pressure on the top and bottom so that the joint comes into contact and then sides so that we get a good, good pressure to glue it. But in some places, the wood isn't flush, and so I have to pad out the blocks with little shims of wood. 
I don't care if the back is irregular. I'm really trying to get the front flush. And so here, just by adding a little bit of a block, I can bring that side up and get a better, more even surface joint. With a little bit of pressure on the top, that's good. Again, here, just a little bit of wood allows me to raise up that edge so that it better meets its partner across the way. Now, the problem with this panel is that it has warped over time and it's not perfectly even. And there are spots like this one where the wood is a little bit proud. And no matter how much I try with little clamps and little shims to bring it down or raise it up, I just can't. So I'm taking one of the clamps and transferring it to the other side of the gantry for a little bit of assistance. And you can see right there, just that one clamp is allowing that section of wood to be pushed down just enough to make sure that the glue joint is even and smooth. And as the camera goes across this joint, if you look at the raking light, you'll notice that it continues across the joint, which indicates that we have a really even bond. And that's what we want. We can't plane the surface down. We can't remove paint to get it flush. We can just do what we can. Now, there will be some irregularities because the wood is old and it's changed and that's kind of out of my control. I can just try to get it as flush as possible. But I think we've got a really good joint here. After a few days in traction, we've removed the panel, we've checked the joint, and now we're ready to move on to the complex big kahuna. And I say complex big kahuna because as I'm running my hand along this, you can see neither of these boards are flush. They have both warped. Imagine one side looking like a W and the other side looking like an M and trying to bond them so that there's as much surface area as possible. Pretty complicated, right? Well, here is another attribute of the new clampinator. I can pull some of those vertical clamps from one side of the gantry and slide them to the other. And then once I've transferred enough of the vertical positions on the top and the bottom over to the other side, I can move the gantry and then I can position it across the joint. And that means that the joint is going to be in between all of these vertical clamping bodies. Kit and I are going to put tons of little blocks on, make sure everything is aligned where we want. And then, once again, glue on the joint. Nothing fancy here, nothing special, just more hide glue. And you'll see some places where Kit drips the glue on the surface, right there. Doesn't matter. It'll all come off when we clean the painting. I'll position the panel in place. I'll start to align it. We will use the bottom clamps to raise up this piece of the wood, the joint, because again, it's convex. We'll position all of these blocks, and then we'll start clamping it. But here is the difference in what we're doing now versus what we did before. As we raise the panel up and get it loosely into position, allowing that curvature to remain, we have to compensate for the waviness of the panel, for how some sections won't line up. And so Kit and I will work in unison to bring this panel down or up where it needs it. We'll exert some pressure from the sides so that we have a joint that is starting to get together. And then we'll go along from one end to the other and we'll start fine tuning. And by fine tuning, really what I mean is if the side on the left is proud, then I'll use the clamp body on the left to press it down. And if the side on the right is too short, I'll use the clamp body underneath on the right to raise it up. What we are trying to do is raise and lower each point of contact so that we have a flush joint. And we're doing it incrementally so that we're not just pressing down on one side, we're trying to press down on each or press up on each. So a little bit on either side as opposed to one side being distorted more than the other. And we're going to make multiple passes at doing this. It's really important that we try to even out all of the changes we're exerting on this panel because it'll make for a more even distribution of tension and a better joint. And we'll go back and forth, adding pressure on the sides, changing things on the vertical, adding pressure on the sides, changing the vertical. 
There's no set pattern for this. It's really just about getting the results we want. So again, back and forth, we're looking. And in this section, we have to raise or lower one side. It looks like Kit has to raise her side. So I'm checking and she's raising. Then we go on to another section and I'm pressing down the piece of wood that's on my side and then checking it to see if it's flush. So by having clamps on either side of the joint, we can raise or lower that joint to make sure it's flush. And that's really one of the great attributes of Clampinator 2.0, the ability to control for wavy panels in multiple directions, not just to control for one convex shape, but to control for a W or an M. And it seems to be working really well. But as we go along and take a look at the joint itself, I can notice just how starved it is, just how open it is, how many gaps are there. And that means that this joint really isn't structural. And that's a problem we're going to have to address, you guessed it, next time.